Welcome to the Paranormal Stakeout Radio TV show with Larry Lawson. As a former career law enforcement officer and law enforcement educator, Larry focuses on the use of tried and true law enforcement investigative techniques in conducting paranormal investigations. Despite his experience and training, Larry also and keeps an open mind to discussions on topics that deal with evidence that are not quite as physical in nature. Paranormal stakeout guests are professionals in the field of the paranormal and parapsychology, conducting the investigations and research needed to further the cause of paranormal study. Larry advocates an agenda of standardization of structure and training in the field of paranormal investigation and research for the purpose of one day being able to produce the evidence needed to convince a jury of the existence of the paranormal. Whether it is ghosts, UFOs, unsolved mysteries, hauntings or cryptids, no topic is beyond the investigative reach of Larry Lawson and the Paranormal Stakeout Radio TV show team. Now, here is the host of the Paranormal Stakeout Radio TV show, Larry Lawson. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout. I'm your host, Larry Lawson, coming to you from the headquarters of the Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation and Indian River Hauntings in beautiful Vero Beach, Florida, where it's uh, it may be wintertime everywhere else, but at least we can still wear shorts and uh, no jackets here most of the time. I know uh, our friends up north always get mad at me for that, but I got to get that dig in there. But anyway, folks, welcome back to the show. Uh, got a great show for you tonight. Uh, I have the... Uh, Tonight, the preeminent expert on the paranormal in Gettysburg, the Dean of Goats, I call him, uh, Mark Nesbitt. Mark was a National Park Service Ranger and historian for many, many years at Gettysburg, and he started researching searching and writing about the ghosts of Gettysburg. Uh, he had a unique inside view as to uh, what it was like on the battlefields. He spent a lot of time teaching folks about the battle and the history behind it. Uh, he went on to write his popular Ghosts of Gettysburg series. Um, he's authored over 20 books spanning several genres, including the paranormal history and true crime. Uh, he's been seen on the History Channel, A&E, the Discovery Channel, the Travel Channel, Unsolved Mysteries, and of course, Coast to Coast uh, over the years. Uh, he's also created the very successful Ghosts of Gettysburg Candlelight Walking Tours. So tonight I'd like to welcome the Dean of Ghosts of Gettysburg, Mr. Mark Nesbitt. Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, Larry. Thank you. It's really good to have you back on the on the show and chatting to you about one of my personal favorite places in the whole world, history-wise, and that's Gettysburg, a, a place of great sadness, but of great history also. Um, so Welcome. Uh, many of the folks that are watching tonight, I'm sure, are aware of you. They've read your books. Maybe you've taken your tours. But for those that may be under a rock somewhere or have been sleeping for the last 20 years that don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay. Well, I, uh, as far as Gettysburg is concerned, it's been part of my life from the time I was about eight years old. My parents took me to Gettysburg when I was a, a, a very young man, young child. And um, we... Uh, it, we you know, I had weird feelings there even back then. It was a place that uh, really struck me as, as kind of unusual. And then I finally I got a chance to work there for the Park Service when I was uh, uh, just before this senior year in college and uh, lucked out. I want I would have done anything, you know, to, to live to be in Gettysburg for a while. And um, it turned out that uh, the National Park Service was looking for rangers that particular summer. And so I got an opportunity to work there uh, that first summer, uh, learned the ropes, and then eventually uh, stayed on with them for a number of years, got into uh, the um, law enforcement end of it for a little while, and then um, kind of left and decided I wanted to be a freelance writer. I wanted to be a writer, left a real good job to be a freelance writer, which is Hmm. In the long run, it was fine. But looking back, the first couple of years after that, hmm. it was pretty stupid. But um, the uh, it, it all worked out fine. I had some contracts with the National Park Service. 
um, and then uh, ended up doing some research for historical artists uh, that were doing uh, Civil War themes, and then um, uh, started writing my own my own books after that. That have been very, very, very successful. Now, while you were a ranger, you also became a licensed battlefield guide. Aren't all rangers uh, experts in in taking folks, interpretive rangers anyway, being you know taking folks on the battlefield, or is that a special rank or whatever? Well, the licensed battlefield guide, they, we were uh, self-employed, and so oh, okay. they the only connection with the National Park Service is that the Park Service license licenses the guides. So the, uh, I had to take a special test as they do now and, mm -hmm. um, and demonstrate uh, that I could take someone on a, on a tour, but it, I kind of, I was, it was a little bit easier for me because I'd already done that for uh, several years, six or seven years, um, giving talks to uh, thousands of, 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 of visitors, tourists, um, at the various sites. So I had the history down pretty well and the, and the ability to, to present the history. Uh, when you're talking in front of 30 or 40 people four times a day and you do it for f several years, you, you, you immediately know when you've struck a responsive chord and when you've, you've fallen flat. So that's uh, that's where I got my uh, my ability to uh, give tours and things like that. So, but I was I, I was a, a, a licensed battlefield guide for really just a year before I, I mm -hmm. went into business for myself. Gotcha, gotcha. How big is the park? I mean, just to give folks an idea of the the breadth of this. I forgot I forgot how many acres it is, but the uh, from the Peace Light to um, the um, uh, Little Round Top is about six miles, and from side to side, east to west, it's about two or three miles. If you if you include some of the outlying battle areas, you're talking you're talking dozens of miles out of Gettysburg. They had they 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 fought in Carlisle, which oh, is thirty miles north of of, the, and then on a retreat, they uh, fought all through the mountains and on the way back uh, to Williamsport, um, uh, um, Maryland, and when the Confederates finally crossed the river there. So it was, people think it just happened uh, on the park, okay, that the battle mm -hmm. and the fighting just took place on the park, but it was, it was vast. They, in fact, I was just reading the other day about some, some, um, uh, Pretty, pretty good earthworks that are still visible in Bedford, Pennsylvania. That's an hour and a half mm. from Gettysburg driving, you mm. know, so yeah. it, it was a, it was a huge battle and, uh, and a huge campaign. And, um, people, um, think that the only place that could possibly be haunted by the uh, soldiers that died or were wounded in the battle, um, is on the park. So that's where they want to do their, their paranormal investigations. And you can't because of the, the law, but there mm -hmm. are plenty of other places to go that you can, you can do uh, investigations. Well, that's, that's interesting. You bring that up. You cannot conduct a private paranormal investigation anywhere within the actual park. And that's the, that's federal law or. Well, act, no, it's it actually, it's kind of up to the individual um, superintendent, but mm -hmm. they, uh, have closed the park from uh, dusk till dawn. It used to be 10 o'clock that you could stay on the battlefield until, or on the in, on the park until, but they've closed it now from uh, du dusk till dawn to sunset to sunrise. And, um, but, you know, you can do, if you're discreet, if you're discreet, you can do a paranormal investigation on the battlefield, uh, on the park, really anytime, as long as you don't, you know, have not a, a about 50, it. yeah, yeah, 50 people in your group or you're uh -huh. charging, you can't charge uh, money because that's a commercial enterprise and that's, you sure. need a special permit for that. So, um, but the, uh, the, but people get confused about the park and the battlefield because the town was a battlefield. Yes, it was. The college was campus was a battlefield. The um, areas that I found were kind of active paranormally um, um, were out 
by the um, old Alms House, which is out on Business 15, uh, in the back area of a parking lot that used to be a Radio Shack. It, so, you, you know, the, 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 the hauntings are all over um, Gettysburg and um, the, the environs, not just the park itself. Well, I was at the Covered Bridge uh one time and had another one quite an experience quite an experience there i would love to tell you about some time i think you get a kick out of it um, sure you've written all these books and uh yeah every like i said most folks that are aware of the hauntings in gettysburg are aware of your books how did you come to write those books what uh what was the impetus to get that down well as i said after i left the park service i was i was doing some freelance writing and um there was a, a local publisher actually, and he had done a lot of um, uh, books on uh, on Gettysburg in particular, on bullets and armaments and uh, um, and and stories. And I, it started off that I wanted to actually do kind of a revamp of the uh, human interest stories, and Ghosts of Gettysburg was only going to be a chapter, um, now the or a, or a segment, a quarter of the book. Uh, and and someone else came out and wrote a book on the human interest stories of Gettysburg. So I kind of shelved the idea. Then I approached this publisher and I said, would you be interested, years later, would you be interested in, in doing a book on the ghost stories of Gettysburg? And he said, sure, go ahead and write some up. We'll see what it, what it sounds like. And um, so I, I collected all the stories together and wrote them up, stories that I had heard for 10 or 12 years from the time I was a park ranger there. And um, because we, we would get stories from visitors uh, who were out on the battlefield from <clears throat> older park rangers. Some of the stories in the first book, I'd have to call legends because I really don't have a documentation uh, of uh, from whom they came, but mm. it's, um, it, and it took, it took about maybe 10, 12 years to collect all those stories. And I put them together, it took a year to write the book. Uh, I did it in a kind of a unique fashion. Uh, I wrote the history of the mm -hmm. site because I knew it. And then I wrote the ghost stories. And the interesting part is there always seems to be some kind of a connection. You know, mm -hmm. a, a ghost story, if you don't have the history behind the site, it's kind of like, I like to liken it to, you know, you're, you're walking down the street on a dark night and uh, uh, somebody jumps out of the bushes and they go boo, and you're you're scared for you know, ten seconds until you realize it's your idiot brother-in-law, you know, making it. So, but if you know the history of, for example, Gettysburg, what happened, uh, it it gets, it really drives it home. It dri you understand that there these there could be a connection. The history and the paranormal. I've, I've preached this for years, go hand in hand. You can't, you cannot have the ghosts without the history. Right. Um, now these books that you developed over the years later became tours and you started taking people through tours of Gettysburg. Um, how long have you been doing those now? We're in our 30th season. Wow. Three zero. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I got old fast. <laughs> I can't believe it, but uh, yeah, that, actually, the the borough came to me. A, a, a fellow from the borough came to me. Well, and before we do that, we're just about to take our first break. That's how these things go. We get talking. We got to take those breaks. But uh, we're going to get back to the tours in just a few minutes, folks. Mark Nes, but don't leave us. Got some great stories. We'll be back right after these messages. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, on the X-Zone Radio Show, as together we will investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Join me and my special guests from around the world each and every night as we investigate UFOs, ghosts, psychics, Bigfoot, conspiracies, and much, much more. Dare to believe and dare to be heard on the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, Monday through Friday at 11 p.m. on your hometown radio, Classic 1220, classic1220.ca.
And we are back with my guest tonight, Mark Nesbitt. Now, Mark, we are about ready to get into the, you're fairly well-known, I would say famous tours up there in Gettysburg. Um, you were getting ready to tell us how the town came to you and t tell us about that. Well, Walt Powell was the uh, borough historian at the time, and I had served with him on some uh, uh, boards of directors uh, of historic places and sites and things. And he had, he, he, they were having a little bit of a problem in Gettysburg because they had um, just redone uh, over the years the downtown area around the center square of town and uh, buildings were refurbished and trees were planted and everything. But but they seemed to have trouble getting people up there because everybody centered on the tourist area, which is down on Steinware Avenue, closer to the Pickett's Charge area. And so he said, do you think you could develop a tour using your books uh, of the downtown area? And uh, maybe it'll help draw some people to uh, the downtown and we can show them that. So I said, sure, I can give it a try because I had developed tours for the Park Service before. So I uh, put together a tour and um, it was, it, it's kind of interesting because going into it and as a business was kind of interesting because all of a sudden I had to uh, I spent three thousand dollars on a uh, on on uh, uh, brochures. I mm -hmm. contracted with a teacher who had the summer off and and said it's three thousand dollars too much or, or not enough to get you to, to sell tickets. You know, and she said I'm I'm in for three grand. <laughs> so already already I'm in, into it for six thousand. I remember the first night that the tours went off, and um, I was standing there in the center square. And I was doing a head count and we were charging $6 a tour uh, back in those days. And I counted 10 people. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, oh, Mark, what in the world did you do now? <laughs> you know, I got to, I got to come well, up with six grand. Into, yeah. yeah. And, but it gradually, we were lucky because we were the first ones and uh, everybody was interested in it. All the, the local uh, TV stations uh, came uh, and did uh, uh, stories on it, and so and radio stations and everything. So I was very lucky because we had great publicity for it. And um, over the years now, it's it's, it's grown, and we, you know, well, not a whole lot of business mom and pop businesses stay open for thirty years. So, yeah, and you started this before uh, a lot of the ghost investigation, ghost hunting, if you'll excuse the term, was in vogue. So you, that is correct. So, uh, what do you? How do you keep things fresh with these tours? Well, we, I'm actually on uh, Ghosts of Gettysburg Nine now, so the stories keep coming in, mm -hmm. and um, so we can change those stories anytime we want because it's not recorded. It's we have live guides. And the guides also lend something to it as well, because um, we, we promise an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes per tour, depend, depending on what tour you take. And um, the um, guides can choose. So if, uh, whatever stories they want, I give them more stories than they can use on one tour. So if you take one of our tours and you have, say, Sally, for a guide, if you come in uh, next year and get Sandy for the guide, you may get a whole different tour. Some of the stories, some of the classics will be the same classic stories, but you will probably get a different tour depending on the guide because they all have their favorite stories and I'll tell them. And, and a different take on things. Yeah, I, I get that. So let's, as these tours go on, I do tours myself, so I, I get how this works as far as the guests have. Do your guests often experience things, and what is it? What do they? What's the most common experience that your guests have? Guests do experience things, and um, it, it, it it's not always visual. In fact, it mm -hmm. rarely is, because mm -hmm. if 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 you if you look at my books and do a little survey of them, you find out that only about ten percent of all the stories in my books are visuals. Um, the most common um, experience is auditory. You'll hear something at Gettysburg before you'll see it. And they report hearing 
uh, footsteps following the tour and they'll turn around and uh, nobody, they're the last ones on the street. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they've also heard uh, cheering, large bodies of men cheering. They'll hear um, uh, cannons firing, Mm -hmm. the rattle of musketry. They'll hear that. They have heard that. Um, the other thing that happens, because all the um, the senses are involved when you're having an experience, a paranormal experience, um, is the uh, uh, is is olfactory. People will smell things on our tours. For example, they'll smell. Um, they, they come back and they say, "I smell rotten eggs on the on the." And there's no reason for it. And I said, well, not not a normal reason, but there may be a paranormal reason. Of course, that's sulfur. And sulfur mm-hmm. was one of the main components of black powder, which was the main propellant in those days for the weapons that they used. Um, they'll smell uh, old-fashioned perfume. They said, my grandmother used to wear that perfume. And what they're probably smelling is a remnant of the the women in Gettysburg who would um, go out right after the battle and try and do their shopping. And um, the wind would change and the smell of decomposition would roll through the town. And they, they, so they'd soak their handkerchiefs in this lilac water or rose water and just, just put it up to their nose when Mm -hmm. this would happen. And and because you can't run away from that that smell, it's uh, pretty pervasive. So um, those are some of the things that that our people have experienced, and photographs as well. Uh, photographs, I'm always a little leery about because um, a lot of them are in windows. Windows have reflections, and Her so door. yeah, exactly. And so you have mm-hmm. to be a little careful about some of that stuff. But uh, but Saks Bridge, as you mentioned. Is yeah. uh, now it's not, not on our tour, but it's a very active place, and there aren't any windows out there to get any reflections from. Yeah, I've I've got a, a very significant significant story on that bridge where a large chain fell as we were sitting inside of it, and I got I snapped a picture just as it happened, and everybody's looking at it like, what was that? Hmm. But there was no chain. Hmm. There was no chain that fell. So, that, oh, sure. and a couple of other things that I want to. But yeah, Saks Bridge, yeah. and th- that's an interesting story because uh, can you tell us what happened there? That was a significant uh, event. Right. Saks Bridge was actually used. That is is virtually the original bridge. Probably 80% of it oh. is original. Um, and it was used by both Union and Confederates to get to the battlefield and eventually uh, ended up in the rear of the Confederate line. Uh, and so... Um, that whole area became a vast hospital for the Confederates. And whenever you have a hospital, you have, of course, amputations, you have a a lot of, a lot of pain, a lot of uh, emotion. Uh, Am I going to make it home? You know, you're thinking about your, your wife or your kids. Um, And then whenever you have a a hospital, you also has have death. And so, there are a lot of burials. There were a lot of burials out there. And we uh, know that when the Confederate army left, they left in a hurry. And and some of the burials were not taken care of. And so if there are any, there are several places out at Gettysburg that there are probably still uh, some Confederates buried there because there are a bunch missing. Uh, uh, Greg Coco, who wrote a book on that, uh, uh, estimated that there were anywhere from 800 to, to 1,200 Confederates that were unaccounted for, which means they could still be buried out on the battlefield. Dear Lord, and and if memory serves, Gettysburg was the largest loss of American life of any battle, any war, battle that we, we've had, because both sides were Americans. Correct. 51,000 casualties is what we used to say uh, back in the the day when I worked uh, for the National Park Service, which is uh, Yankee Stadium holds 52,000 fans. So anytime it's on TV, you just look around at that stadium and that's how many people were in Gettysburg, just the wounded 
and and dead mm. um, after the after the battle. Mm. What most significant spot? I've got two questions here. The most significant spot for activity on your tours, and then the most significant spot that you personally know of for paranormal activity. On our tours, I, you know, there's a lot that goes on. We have a tour that goes to the Carlisle Street and Gettysburg College campus. And there's a lot that goes on on that campus. Um, why? I don't know. Uh, I think it's because of all the energy that's up there. We all know what a college campus is like, you know, especially like on a Saturday night after a football game and everything. There's a lot of energy. And uh, my theory is that the the – you know, the, the ghosts need energy from somewhere because they don't eat. You know, we, we get our energy from a breakfast and lunch and dinner. They don't, they can't do that. So I think they maybe borrow it from us or from, for example, uh, running water, moving water, like Saks Bridge, the water that goes yep, underneath yep. that. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of energy at what, 1300 pounds a square, a cubic uh, uh, yard of water. There's a mm -hmm. lot of energy there. And um, so I would say the Gettysburg College campus is probably uh, is probably pretty active. Uh, and as far as the battlefield is concerned, people always ask me, where's the most haunted place on the battlefield? And I tell them they're, they're, it changes, but there are two that we know of for sure. Uh, one would be Devil's Den okay. and the other would be right next to it, the Triangular Field. Triangular I've gotten more yeah. stories from that area and they just just keep coming in so yeah and people don't realize there's still a, a the gettysburg college is still a very active very vibrant uh, university there so uh, this is a lot this is a lively town it isn't just uh stuck in history it keeps growing <laughs> oh yeah yeah it does um we have you know and and they're uh, are always trying to do things for the visitors for the tourists in town like we had a huge christmas week uh that went on and 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 obviously the fourth of july is right on the anniversary of the battle july 1st 2nd and 3rd 1863 was about fourth of july weekend so there's a lot of activity uh throughout the year uh in gettysburg not just in the summertime one of my favorite stories i think it was in actually one of the college dorms where somebody took an elevator downstairs and they opened it and there was a, a battlefield hospital in there. Was that, is there any, yeah. is that a pretty, pretty true story, I guess. Right. Well, yeah. Uh, that's when one of my books in my first book, and then uh -huh. um, it, it turns out that I knew, well, I knew the people that happened to, uh -huh. and um, they, uh, and I researched it. So I did. Well, we take a break? Do, okay. Yeah, we got to take a break, but that's, <laughs> that's okay. Fine. We keep people hanging that way. So stay with us. Yeah, folks. Well, We're going to hear about the, the battlefield hospital that appeared inside a co the college uh, building. So stay with us. We'll be back right after these messages. Are you ready for a tale that will leave you on the edge of your seat? Get ready to dive into the gripping memoir by Bart Sabrell titled Moon Man. Bart Sabrell takes you on a heart-pounding journey, unmasking the truth behind America's famous Apollo missions. Prepare yourself for hair-raising encounters with agents from the U.S. government's top secret agencies. In Moon Man, Sabrell fearlessly reveals his real-life espionage adventures, shining a light on one of the CIA's best-kept secrets. Brace yourself for shocking revelations, including Sabrell's discovery of privately recorded audio exposing an Apollo astronaut's chilling plot, a plot orchestrated by the CIA. That's right. As Sabrell unveils this groundbreaking evidence, it becomes clear that there is much more to the Apollo missions than meets the eye. Could it be that we've been deceived all along? Moon Man is a gripping page turner that challenges everything you thought you knew. It's a mind-bending journey into the unknown where the line between truth and fiction becomes blurred. Don't miss this opportunity to uncover the secrets hidden for decades. Let your curiosity guide you as you join Bart Sabrell on his quest to find the truth. Moon Man, available now at Sibrel.com. That's S-I-B-R-E-L.com. 
Prepare to have your beliefs shaken to the very core. back with my guest tonight, Mark Nesbitt. We were just about ready to get into one of the more interesting stories that I'm aware of out of Gettysburg. And it, w- w- it was a building where some folks took an elevator. They went to the, I'm going to say the basement for, as memory serves, and the door is open and they're in the middle of a Civil War operating room. Uh, so why don't you take that one from the top? You say you know the folks that, that it Yeah. That. Uh, the place was Pennsylvania Hall. And it was, it's called Old Dorm. And it was used as a dormitory uh, at Gettysburg College. It was called Pennsylvania College at the time of the battle. That was one of the three main buildings uh, on the college campus. Being one of the largest buildings, it was confiscated by the uh, surgeons as soon as they um, they uh, uh, got into town because they knew they were going to need a great big area to operate on, on people. And sure enough, it filled up with uh, wounded soldiers. Um, mostly the lower floors were the operating rooms, upper floors were for recovery. And um, so it was it was a pretty horrific site in that area. So uh, fast forward now to the 1980s, it's, it's now and was then the uh, administration building for Gettysburg College. And a couple of my friends were working late at night at the um, uh, upstairs on the fourth floor, uh, getting some things taken care of. And they ended up, um, staying too late and they said, okay, let's go. It's time to leave. So 11 o'clock, they got on the elevator, elevator descended. And just as you said, the doors it went past the first floor where the exits are, went into the basement, doors open to a, a horrible site of a, of a, of a hospital scene with, with wounded soldiers all around the corners, uh, a, a, a surgeon in the middle with a, with a saw, a bloody saw, ready to operate on some poor guy on this makeshift operating table. Well, they couldn't get the elevator to work, of course. Uh, it wouldn't close. The doors wouldn't close. Finally, they closed, and they ended up going uh, back up to the first floor, went immediately over to uh, security to report this. Now, the security guard became a friend of mine later on, and I interviewed him about it. And he said, yes, they were they were scared to death. And we went right over there. It was a minute between the time they got to, to me and I. we got over there. And they went down in the elevator again. The doors opened, and it was pristine. It was all whitewashed because that's the way it was before uh, they had their – Um, computer parts and the the paper and stuff and everything down there. So there's no explanation for that. But the strange part is a number of years later, stranger than that. Well, it's actually, it's kind of interesting because it, I I always look for this. I have a chapter called deja vu in my last book. What happened, what I, what I realized is after 20 some years, things are happening again in the same site, same venue, whole different set of people, same events. Okay, so I'm starting to collect those. And this was one of them. I was doing an autographing at Gettysburg College, and a couple came up to me, and they said, we know that woman that that happened to. I said, and I named the two. They said, no. I said, what's going on? Do you have another name? And they gave me another name. The, The circumstances were a little different. She was actually working for a um, a uh, auditing firm out of Lancaster. They came to audit Gettysburg College. She was up on the top floor. They asked they asked her, "Would you please uh, go down to the cars and get some paperwork?" She got in her in the elevator and went down. Doors open, and she had exactly the same experience. I called her up. I interviewed her, and um, uh, she said, and she she just told me the story, the same description that I got from uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the security officer. So that's two, actually three individuals that had exactly the same experience uh, in that building. And I'm tracking down a fourth. Uh, Interesting. Uh, yeah. But, but the reason I'm interested in this deja vu thing, in other words, things that happen again, is because 
you know, you're a, you're a paranormal researcher. You know, you can't. It's very difficult to 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 do a scientific study of these because one of the things the scientific method requires is for you to experiment and recreate the experiment yeah. so that it can be done over and over and over again. Virtually impossible. But what we can do is we we can with good record you know recording techniques we can we can get these events that are happening in the same place over and over again and record them. Mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden you do have an experiment that's 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 being go done over and over and over again, but we're just recording it. And, it and it's happened all over all the time in the battlefield if you study them long enough. Well, uh, this is good. This kind of causes me to gut off my track of it because I had some other questions to go along with this. And we may get to that in our, our fourth session, but this makes me want to kind of head down a different road. And I'm going to, it's a rhetorical question, but Mark, do you believe that ghosts exist? I'm um, assuming at this point. Uh, yes. Well, you, you know, I, I really didn't, you know, I'm, 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 let me put it this way. I'm a skeptic. Okay, I'm okay. trying to remain a skeptic as much as I possibly can. Uh, being being objective, you know, writers are supposed to be objective. That's what I try and do. That's what However, I've I've run into three or four different uh, scientific uh, theories and scientific proofs that it's possible for ghosts to exist, um, and some of it goes to directly to uh, quantum. There are things in quantum theory, uh, physics, but one of the things, for example, one of the things is uh, uh, a, a researcher uh, in the old uh, in, in uh, Polish research in the old Soviet Union, back when they could do tests like this, did tests on dying people, and he realized that under death, when you're dying, the body at the point of death gives off um, photons, a huge burst of light energy that's a thousand times greater than what we give off when we're, when we're alive. He called it a, a death shout that the body gives off. And of course, the that kind of goes along with what's known as the stone recorder theory, which says that mm. whatever the, you know, if there's some sort of quartz around, uh, then there's a very good possibility that uh, electromagnetism can be captured in that. You see where I'm going with this? You got oh, I you do. Know, I thousands do. of men uh, dying in one area. You have Gettysburg full of granite, which is mm -hmm. full of quartz. And you may have the reason why we get uh, residual hauntings. In other words, like a recorder that, that plays over and right. over and over again. The question is, what is it that sets it off? What what releases, what button do you push, you know, to like on your mm -hmm. computer to get that information back that's been recorded in in the courts uh, around Gettysburg? So those are just a couple things that have convinced me that there's something going on. We Gettysburg is, what. yeah. Yeah, and, and then you kind of hit the second part of my question. What do you think it is? Uh, your your opinion, correct me if I have this wrong, is that it's more of an energy that has been captured and is somehow released at certain times. But if that's the case, what about folks that have actually interacted supposedly with folks they thought were reenactors? Right. Well, that first of all, er yeah. Well, first of all, everything has to be energy. Okay, matter is energy. It's frozen energy, according to Einstein. Um, so, in order for it to be in this world, it has to be some kind of energy. The interactive hauntings, okay, uh, where I guess they're the scariest because the, you actually um, they're intelligent hauntings. They actually acknowledge you, the living. Mm -hmm. uh, the dead mm -hmm. acknowledge the living. Um, that's that and either talk to you or look at you or intelligent haunts we call it yeah intelligent or haunting. Sentient, yeah <clears throat> right um what causes that that might be something a little more on the quantum side um i think that there are also um parallel universes a possibility okay. 
there's a there is a, a great physicist uh, at Harvard, Harvard, Lisa Randall is her name, and she has this theory about uh, parallel worlds, and they're actually like parallel things that that are living right next to each other, that are existing right next to each other. She calls them brains, B-R-A-N-E-S, brains, like membranes. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking that maybe they're kind of like 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 rubber and malleable, and every once in a while they cross. And when they cross, that's when you get, you can see into the other one, okay? Sometimes we'll mm-hmm. call it a warp, where, the, where it seems like the, the time mm-hmm. rips open and then it closes. It doesn't last very long. But that would be a physics um, explanation for why we have uh, intelligent hauntings. But that would cause, for example, and, and I don't remember the details of this story, was where a, uh, a guest at the park saw an individual in a, in a union uniform, I believe, and they actually talked and they interacted, and then she turned around and he was gone. Th- through that theory, I come to the conclusion that at least one side knows they're passing back and forth. And therefore, they they're they're easy they're easily able to communicate, and not be shocked when they see somebody in another dimension. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Well, that you know, once again, that that begs the question. You know, just like we can occasionally see them, can they see us? Oh yeah. And apparently, they yeah. can because they do react uh, to us to our presence there. And speaking of that story, and. St- Speaking deja vu, I got a, I did get a second um, witness to that fellow. Gave the same description. Never read my story. Mm-hmm. Gave the same description to him, and he looked at her, and um, he, he, we think he was from the first Texas, okay? Because okay. Texas is it was the unit that took over uh, Devil's Den. Because he he stood there when she looked up, she said this ragged guy was standing in front of me. He looked at me and he pointed at my sweatshirt and he said, first Texas. And I looked down and, and she had, had worn that burn orange Texas uh, oh. football shirt. And she looked down and she looked up and he was gone, but he spoke to her. And so that was, that was a remark. That's two from that, that soldier, if it's the same soldier and the description was the same. And you know, I kind of almost feel the hair standing up now. And, and the big thing, Mark is, I'm a cop. You were a cop. We, you know, we look for hard evidence. Yet these things keep happening, and there's got to be a reason for it. And that's, I know, one of the reasons why you you look at this, and certainly one of the reasons why I investigate this. There's something happening. We just don't know what it is. But we got to take our last break here. So when we get back, I want to talk to you a little bit about your favorite spots, the spots that you find the most uh, active and your most harrowing experience. So folks, stay with us. We'll be back right after these messages with more with, more with Mark Nesmith. Are you ready to dive into the mysteries of the unknown? Tune into the electrifying X Zone Radio TV show hosted by the one and only Rob McConnell. I'm Rob McConnell, and get ready for a mind bending journey through the unexplained phenomenon that surrounds us all. From UFO encounters to cryptids, ghosts, and everything in between, we've got it covered here in the X Zone. Rob McConnell, the seasoned investigator and renowned radio personality, brings you the most compelling interviews with top experts, authors, and experiences from around the world. Each episode is an unforgettable exploration into the depths of the extraordinary. That's right, Exo Nation. Join me every week as we open the door to the supernatural and explore the strange and amazing stories that will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. And it's not just radio anymore. With our groundbreaking TV show, you can now witness the sessions unfold right before your eyes. From chilling reenactments to captivating visuals, prepare yourself for a multimedia experience like never before. 
With a legacy spanning over two decades, the Exxon Radio and TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, is your ultimate source for mind-blowing entertainment and thought-provoking discussions. Join our growing community of truth seekers as we continue to unlock the world's mysteries. So, why wait? Step into the X Zone and embark on a journey that will challenge your beliefs, ignite your curiosity, and keep you on the edge of your seat. Remember, X Zone Nation, the truth is out there, and it's waiting for you right here on the X Zone Radio and TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell. Don't miss a minute of the action. Tune in now on your favorite radio station or visit xzoneradiotv.com to join the adventure. The Exozone Radio TV Show with Rob McConnell, where reality meets the unknown. The Exozone Radio TV Show, unraveling the secrets of the universe, one episode at a time. For more information visit www.xzoneradiotv.com. And we are back with Mark Nesbitt. Fascinating stories. And as always, we never seem to have enough time to cover this. But I, I do want to mention, folks, that if you want to learn more about uh, my organization, the Florida Bureau of Paranormal Investigation and Indian River Hauntings, you can check out our websites at paranormalfbi.com <coughs> or indianriverhauntings.com. If you want to see some of the work that we've done, investigations uh, and the like, you can check us out on YouTube at, that's the uh, symbol for at Indian River Hauntings 2341. Now, if you have some questions, things you'd like to bring, up thoughts on the show email me at ghost guy at paranormal stakeout.org you can see all my past shows on uh paranormal stakeout.org uh, check us out also i'd be remiss if i didn't say there's other great programming right here on the x zone uh, broadcast network so check out xzbn.net to see all the great shows also on the net and mark what's in the future for you any books uh, new books coming out uh, yeah, Larry, I'm getting uh, ready to get Ghosts of Gettysburg 9 out probably this spring. I'm just finishing that up. Um, and we have some special events that we do on special weekends with the Ghosts of Gettysburg uh, tours. We have uh, uh, what we call um, paranormal, paranormal Weekends. We're getting together with a Balladary Inn, which is a wonderful bed and breakfast in Gettysburg. And we're going to do probably three or four paranormal investigations at sites that I mentioned in my book. Um, uh, hidden haunted hotspots of Gettysburg, places that I've never mm -hmm. actually uh, done any other books on, some places that not too many people get to go to. Uh, one of them is at, at the Balladary Inn. Apparently, there are some Confederate soldiers that were buried under what is now the tennis courts out there. And we are going to, in using various methods, try and find out if they really are. And try. I think I was playing a little bit with your audio here, my friend. We cut, got you cut oh. off a little bit there. If you could repeat that, the ghost kind of got into the, our system there. It happens. It happens a lot of these. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the uh, it's a uh, we're doing a paranormal weekend at the Balladary mm -hmm. Inn, and we're going to be doing it um, trying to find some sites that uh, are in my book, Hidden Haunted Hotspots of Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. That's the most recent book that I've come out with. So um, it should be interesting. Yeah. Well. I Look forward to, I may have to take the team up there for a visit uh, to Gettysburg. It's sure. been a couple of years since I've been up there. It's. Uh, um, I got to ask you this question before I start asking about favorite spots and whatnot. A uh, little round top, the the uh, where the last the hook was, where the 20th Maine, Joshua Chamberlain. Uh, I know that history has kind of maybe exaggerated what happened there a tad bit, but still a place of, of honor uh, and probably saved the Union, the Union flank. Uh, the way with uh, what Joshua Chamberlain did. Anything there? Have you ever experienced anything uh, on Little Round Top? I just out of curiosity. Um, other than when I was on patrol at night, mm -hmm. uh, the quote willies, we all know what those are, right? When you're driving along and all of a sudden you, you want to stop and get out of the car and stretch your legs, and all of a sudden you say, 
No, nah, maybe next time it. around the yeah, battlefield. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll go the next time. And uh, but no, that um, uh, is a very uh, uh, in terms of activity. I, I I don't recall a whole lot, although there should be more because there are a lot of people there to witness it. I mean, it's one of the most popular places mm -hmm. on the battlefield. It has been mm -hmm. closed down for the last year and year or year and a half because really? they're, they're redoing. Uh, it, you know, as as they like to say in the park service, it was just loved too much by the by the people you know they just right. went all you know walked all over it and uh mm -hmm. so they had to redo some some pathways and stuff but it should be open i guess sometime this summer okay great now you you've mentioned uh, of course devil's den and the triangular field as spots where many many things have occurred but what is mark nesbitt's favorite spot if you wanted to go find you wanted to experience whatever that other side is whether it's residual whether it's intelligent uh, dimensions crossing where would where would you go well well actually you men named one of them as a triangular field i uh mm -hmm. personally have had more experiences in the triangular field everything from getting my very first evp out there uh i wrote a book called 35 days to gettysburg it was about a confederate soldier and a union soldier i used their diaries to, to to set them up day by day through the entire gettysburg campaign but i also got the confederate soldiers uh, roster of of dead uh, from the his company in the 15th Georgia and um, went out there and and was asking questions using their names and got mm -hmm. somewhat military answers on my recorder when when I played it back uh, also cameras going on the blink constantly out there I had I that. Uh, three of my cameras go and uh, when when people were inter, uh, interviewing me from radio stations, TV stations out there, two TV station, ten fifteen thousand dollar cameras went on the blink out there in a triangular field. So that's a very very active place, at least for me personally. Um, and um, I'm I'm starting to find some others out there as well. East Cavalry Battlefield, three miles outside of town, is 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 kind of active out there and it's quiet not a lot of people know about it of course they do now but <laughs> not a lot of people know about it and if you can get out there you can find spots one of the largest cavalry battles on the north american continent was fought out there ah okay yeah uh, the the most harrowing experience you have ever had out there or i should say significant i mean i, I can't i can't see you getting you know run dude or whatever <laughs> okay i can't yeah. see that uh, but but what's the most significant experience you've had on the field okay this is one that i probably should have run away from but i didn't because i was okay. fascinated um i was called uh to the daniel lady farm by the uh, caretaker out there one day and he said mark if you are if you want to see it a paranormal experience occurring before your very eyes come out here to the lady farm okay so I went out to the lady farm. Daniel Lady Farm was a hospital at the time, like every place was in Gettysburg. And um, he said, uh, I'm not going to say anything. Just going to take you to the room. Yesterday, this was all cleaned up because we had uh, people coming through here and we wanted to look nice. This was the room that was the um, operating room out there. He opened the door and I walked in and I had a video camera going. And he um, didn't say anything, but I looked down on the floor, and there on the floor were streams of a rust-colored liquid flowing, it seemed, towards the depression where the uh, um, fireplace was. Three or four of these things. And I said, did you have a pipe break? He goes, nope. This just, just happened. Uh, it was clean yesterday. It's like this today. I said, all right. I said, do you have a, a, a tissue? He said, yeah. So I'm taking pictures and I dip the tissue in this uh, liquid, not knowing what it is. And uh, I was uh, there for half an hour videotaping, photographing, put a yardstick down there so we could see how long they were and at least five feet long, three or four of them. I said, I, I don't know what to do. He says, I don't know what to do either. I got to go out in the fields. I got work to do. But somehow I got to figure out what I'm going to do with this. I said, okay. So I went back to where we stay in Gettysburg. Two hours later, I got a phone call. Same caretaker. 
I said, what's up? He says, it's gone. I said, what do you mean it's gone? He said, it disappeared. So jumped back in the van, went out there. I had my videotape going and time stamped and everything. And I went in and I looked and sure enough, it was, it had disappeared. And he, you have a video of him getting down, squatting down and, and rubbing his hand over the spot. He said, it was right here, right? I said, yeah. I said, what the, and he looked at his fingertips. They're covered with dust. I'm like, what in the heck just happened here? And Carol, my wife, was with me, and she said, I wonder if the samples are still intact. She ran out to the van, and she found she found them. She said, they're still here. Now, the um, uh, Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Organization Association is pretty well connected. So we sent those samples out to a, um, uh, a forensics lab in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Three weeks later, <clears throat> the results came back. The liquid uh, was blood. The identified species identified yeah. as blood. The species was human. All that blood was human blood, <clears throat> and it disappeared. Now, the strange part about it is that Mrs. Lady's operating room, her her uh, living room there has blood stains in it in the wood from right. the battle there's one handprint there where a poor fellow was picking him pushing himself up and um the blood has was there for 106 still there 167 60 years but that disappeared completely so in other words there's no way he could have cleaned it up and you videoed it when he first called you over there you documented it on video you documented it, it being there and then you documented it's gone yeah that's that's significant now where is this evidence today is it being preserved is that being kept anywhere because i think i find that incredibly significant well the evidence the the video evidence i have and and right. also photographs some of them are in my book i think right. it's the last uh, second from last book and um the uh i didn't give them all the uh evidence that i collected there there were two tissues okay. and they got one and I kept the other. So I have that in my files. So, wow. Now that, that is a cop and evidence collection preservation. Wow. That's huge because how can that occur? How could, is was there any scientific explanation to how. If it would have been rusty water. Okay. Yeah, we yeah, might've come up. Okay. Maybe somewhere, you know, a, a, um, pipe yeah, broke or something no it was blood it was human you know so and i yeah i have no explanation i don't know what happened there a time warp did i go through a time warp there where you know it should have been dry and then it, I, no because it disappeared and and i have everything time stamped so i i don't i don't know larry it's well well folks i'm, I'm here to tell you as a cop and i've been looking for evidence my entire all the years i've been doing paranormal investigations this is significant so uh has anybody done anything else with it i mean is there any well i record it you know i put it in my book and that's about the best account yeah. that uh, yeah. that there is of it well so well i gotta and you know what really stinks is we're out of time my friend we're gonna have to do <laughs> we're gonna have to do this again uh, we i can really yeah, we I, I'll be calling on you anyway. I appreciate you being with us, Mark. Folks, stay tuned. We're going to be getting him back on the show because we've got so much more to talk about in the future. Thank you so much for your time, Mark. Thank you for being here, uh, folks. Thank you for joining us. I do want to mention March 25th, my book Haunted Indian River County is going to be released. You can now pre order it on Amazon. So if you are interested in hearing about the ghosts in here in Indian River County, go to Amazon, look up. Uh, haunt, uh, haunted Indian River County, and you can pre order now. So uh, I'd appreciate that. But I appreciate everybody being here. Thank you for listening. Great show. Uh, take care. Love the family. Hug those kids. And we'll see you on the other side. Have a good night, folks.